All right, you guys ready? So we're going to be going over uh, beginning Git. So the idea is just a demo, um, basically how Git works, some basic commands. It's definitely intended to be beginner level. Um, for you guys that have used Git before, I've got some fun in there, some suggestions, some blog posts that you can pay attention to, uh, see what will work for you. Yeah, there's certainly a lot that Git can do. Uh, it's version control. It's reasonably recent in the last, what, three, four, five years. Uh, the Linux kernel now runs on Git. Lots of projects have kind of switched over. And, and the reason is it's a <coughs> version control that makes it easy to share back and forth with other people. <coughs> so you can work on the project, and it's not rigidly controlled at a central point the way most version control systems are. So at any point, I can work remote, and I was working in the car on the way down here. I uh, managed to break our app as I walked out the door. So I have a full copy of the repository. I can work remotely in it, and it's, so it's a terrific way to go. <clears throat> cool. My name is Tim Harvey. I'm a uh, developer at Squaremouth. Uh, we sell travel insurance online. It's all we do. So our product is our app, and Rails is a big part of that now. All right, cool. So I'm going to assume that you have been able to find a blog post on how to get Git up and running on your machine. So from the very beginning, we're going to start up an app. I'm going to create a directory here. And the command I want you to get used to using all the time is git status. Um, this is your friend. This is always going to tell you what's going on, where am I at, why are things happening. So git status in an empty project, there's nothing. It's telling you. Uh, not a Git repository. So the very first thing we do is git init. And this will get the repository kind of jump started. And the path that you're seeing over here is the .git folder. And that's what it asks <coughs> your projects to track everything. So your project's still going to act like a normal folder. Your files are sitting there. But git in the background is using this .git folder to track everything. Um, you can do some interesting things in your console here. I actually show some Git information. This is, like I said, a lot you can customize with Git. Um, I'll focus mostly on the basics here, but you can go nuts with it. All right, so we have ourselves a Git repository. That's all it takes. So now when we do Git status, it tells us a couple things. I'm on the master branch. In a sense, these are different paths that your code can take. Master is the default, and that's where we start out at. And I'll show you in a bit how we can diverge from that. But it tells you you have nothing to commit. We just sort of have an empty project. So kind of the key concept in version control is how you track changes. So it's called a commit. So first thing we'll do is actually create some files uh, and put those into our repository. So now that we do git status, it tells us we have untracked files. That's git's way of telling you that I don't know about this new readme file. I see that it's in your project, I don't know what you want to do with it yet. And so we'll get to that in a moment. Where do we go next? Git typically will give you some help. You'll see on the screen here it says, use git add files to start including things. So the git status command, if you forget everything else today, remember that. Because typically it'll give you some help on what your next step is. So we'll go ahead and get some information in this readme. And so the way git operates, it's almost like, think of it like a shopping cart. So we have files in our repository, in our folder. And when we're ready to begin putting those into Git, into this repository that stores all our code, we add them to what it's called the staging area. That's just Git's way of saying, almost like a shopping basket. And that's what this git add command says. I want to include some files to be committed. So I take the readme file and add it to this cart, this staging area of files. And nothing's really changed at that point, but now when we run git status, after doing add, so I now have it in the staging area, git says, ah, I have changes that are going to be committed. Now they haven't been yet, but you can queue up one or more files and they're ready to be stored permanently as a version. So changes to be committed, it says, ah, I have a new file, never seen this one before, so I'm going to be adding it brand new to the repository, and now we do commit. Uh, shorthand here, I'm going to do a dash M on the command line to give it a message to explain. This basket of files, this staging area, what, it, what is it? What did I do? 
And so I'll just call it initial commit. And so now it says, okay, I changed, added a file. We've got inserts, delete, some other output there. We'll come back and do get status again. It says, ah, nothing to commit. So we're sort of at the stable point now. I made a change, add it into my staging area, and then say, yes, here's a descriptive way to know what, it, what was that change, what was it. And now your repository is at a stable point. So in the folder now, we have the readme file that we created, and this .git folder that Git, the software on your machine, uses to track everything. Ruby. As a brief aside too, this is pre-recorded, and I'm gonna go ahead and do a voiceover later, so if you wanna kinda of go through this again, uh, if you're bored and it's late, I'll have this online at some point. Cool, so now what happens when we make another change? In the back of your mind, be thinking about the projects you do. So we tweak a file. Now it says, ah, I have a changed file. Before, it was a file that Git didn't know about. Now, because it's part of the, re the repository, Git's looking at this file and says, ah, you changed something. Similar to before, we do a Git add. Once again, we say, well, here's a file that Git sees has changed. We put it into the staging area. We're adding it to this bundle of files that are going to change. We're going to give that a commit message. We're going to describe what did we do. Again, get status tells us we have changes to be committed. We have to remember to commit them, otherwise they're just parked out there. So we'll say, yep, get commit. We'll give that a description. I'll show you a blog post here in a little bit. Um, I try to keep all the commit messages, and this blog post outlines why you should do this. But keep everything like active. Update readme. Not past tense, updated because really I like to think about this commit will do something to your code. Because with Git, because it's a version control, you can move backwards in time. You can undo things. And then you maybe need to redo something. So it's nice to look at it in terms of this commit will do something to your code. Add a feature, update a readme. So here we can look at a log. And this is a quick way to look at what has Git recorded that's happened. So we have a few things going on here. See this crazy long, I think it's called a hash. It's a unique identifier that tells us what is this commit? How could I talk about that if I need to reference it? it? Gets us some basic information about who did it, when, and then the message. And one thing I'd recommend you do is treat commits as permanent. So the other day I wasn't really watching what I was doing, and so we ended up with a bug fox. <laughs> so I kind of recommend you don't do that. Um, but once a commit gets shared with other people, because that's part of the point of the, the code and the, having this repository on your team or individually, makes it easy to share your code around. So don't, don't do this. You know, take a moment before you uh, bang in a commit message and have something bad. So as I was getting started with Git, I was an independent consultant, no team, nobody else to work with. And I thought, well, what's really the point of using Git? I don't really need version control. It's just me. I don't have much of anything to track. And I'll show you here a little bit of a workflow that was really helpful and that changed my mind and got me into Git. It's really not, not only is it good to track where is your code come from in case you ever need to go back, but the ability with Git to do what's called branching and merging, it's this idea of that I can kind of go off on a tangent for a little while and then immediately jump back to a different point. And so I'll show you here a situation where a customer says, now, I want all these changes, and so you go down that path, and they said, well, we have this thing on the live site we need fixed now. Well, in the past, it's always been this awful situation where you have stuff in progress that can't go out on the site, but you need to make this change immediately. With Git, it's easy. Uh, if you guys that have done Git a lot, uh, this branching model, and I'll, I'll put this up somewhere, uh, if you go to links.timharvey.net, um, I've got copies of this stuff. But this is a great process for a larger scale project. So for you guys that have used Git a ton, this is probably the best example. This guy's got great diagrams, charts, the whole nine yards of how to use branching at kind of a crazy level. Uh, we've used most of this on our project. It's been really helpful. All right, so diving back. We're going to do a checkout, dash B, and this is going to create a branch. And all a branch really is, imagine a fork in the road. 
we're going to create this feature, and this this dash b here is simply a name. I'm going to call this branch feature setup Rails app, and feature comes out of this blog article. Since we're creating something new, we're going to call it feature. So we're going to take this fork in the road to create this Rails app. And uh, sorry, Miles, my app's going to go a little bit faster. You'll you'll like how I create this little uh, cop copy I've done. So I, we have our buddy Irv at the building we work in in Fort Wayne. And Irv's Cafe is this tiny little restaurant. We love this guy, and we don't want him to close. So we made him a website to help promote his business. And so the first feature for our customer here is we're going to create this Rails app. So I went in and just copied an app we already had uh, created ahead of time, so I cheated. And so in pulling this over, Git status provides some really interesting information. We've got this up here. It says changed, but not updated. What's that all about? That's my readme file. So we want to figure out what's going on there. And then down here we have a bunch of new files. So we want those in our readme file, or we want those in our repo. But this whole change but not updated, we don't want our readme changed. So one of the things Git allows you to do is run a diff that says, well, what's different about this file? What is Git seeing that's changed? And so this is great output to say, ah, the red is it ripped out what I had in there. And because I copied over this project, it copied in all this uh, boilerplate from Rails. So Git makes it really easy to back up. So we're in the middle of making these changes. Git says, hey, I see something that's different here. Do you want to keep that? Now I can add it to the staging area and commit it, and then it's permanent. It's permanent as anything is. Or I can say, wait a minute, check out the old version. Go reach back in time and pull a version forward. And so with git checkout readme, it's going to go grab my most recent copy, the one I've saved. And so it's a great way if you're plowing down the road with some code and make some mistakes and you wreck your app, just check it out and it comes right back to your last commit. As you get more comfortable with Git, you can pick how far back you want to go. Which version do you need? All right, so we're back to just having some untracked files. So we'll add those to our repository. And we'll get that stuff committed. Again, I always like to look at Git status. These are all green now. They're in my staging area. They're ready to be committed. I'll give that a message here. We've got our initial Rails app. Cool. So now, remember, we're in a fork in the road. So our Git log says I have three commits. Well, this most recent one is in this fork, this, this uh, branch. And so I can see I'm on branch feature, set up Rails. So I'm going to go back to master. So I'd say Git checkout master. And so I'm going to merge. I want to bring back that commit that's in the feature. And so all a merge is really going to do is say, take this branch, take everything over there, and pull it to where I'm at. So now if I run a git log on this master branch, I should see my Rails app commit. Cool. So imagine for a moment, you have a bunch of changes on your branch. You're able to step out to this branch, make changes as you go, commit every few hours, every few days. And then all at once, when that stuff's ready and done, it's at a good point. Merge it in, you're good to go. So kind of the next thing I want to show is what happens when I'm in the middle of a branch and a customer calls up with an emergency. Um, for you guys that have been doing Git a while, the Pro Git book, it's a pretty good book and the guy's got a copy of it online. So this is a great resource, it's progit.org. One of the really nice things he does is has some excellent diagrams. He just so, dropped that Git ref, yeah, have you seen that too? That same author just launched the gitref.org. That is pretty recent. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty decent too. Yeah, it's goofy. Git's kind of, the Git docs themselves are like really nerdy and kind of hard for me to read. It's kind of very Linuxy. Um, so I prefer some of these things. Cool. So what's going to happen? So C0, what is all this stuff? So commit 0, commit 1. So we have 3 already. And that's master. That's kind of where our master is at. So we're going to dive off in one direction, this thing down at the bottom, and we're going to create a feature. So our customer calls up, our Irv, Irv's Cafe, says, hey, I have some new specials. I want you to update the dates on my specials. I want you to put in the new menu items and go for it. Now what's going to happen is midway through that, Irv's going to call up with a hot fix, something that's an emergency, but the things we're already working on aren't ready for the site.
We got 10 minutes and you're done. All right, so get status, we're on master. So we're going to create a new branch, dash B, so we check out feature update specials. So this is where your customers called up, they've asked for some feature, something new. We're going to fire up the web server and take a look at the site as it sits. So here's the freebie website for Irv, and on his front page he has a date and a special. And so these are now out of date, this is last week dates. So we're going to update the dates and put in the new menu items. Now in typical customer fashion, Irv told us to update the dates and he said, I'll get back to you with the menu items. So we're kind of waiting on him a little bit too. So we'll jump into the Rails view. We'll go ahead and do the changes that we know. We'll update the dates here. And once we get this done, this is where our customer calls up with their emergency. And so Irv says, you know what? Nobody likes this Arial font, this sans serif. So we're going to go with serif fonts. And we think Irv's a little bit nuts. We all hate serif fonts, but we're going to do it anyways. There's the, there's the customer. So the interesting thing is, in my previous experience, when I was midway through changes, you'd have to copy the project off to the side. You'd FTP down their current version. It was awful. So here in this situation, we're in a branch making these changes and committing these. And Git allows you to jump out of the branch, do something different, and come back when you're ready. All right, so we went ahead and committed these changes. All right, getting to the committing part. Cool. So our feature is kind of midway. It's not quite complete. We changed the dates. We still need to update the menu items. Word's not ready for that. So here we've got our four commits here. Update dates for specials, the most recent. And this is where we get the phone call. It says, I got this fixed to make real fast. Change to serif fonts. So we move back to master. And the reason for that is master's our most stable version. So we've only got our three commits here. And so we know that our specials are not updated on this master branch. It's kind of like a fork in the road. Features over here. Master's back a little ways. So we jump backwards. Now we'll create a branch for this hot fix. Say, okay, we're going to tweak this font for our customer. We create a branch. Takes our master that we're on and dupes this. And now we're on a second fork in the road. So now we jump into the CSS and we'll make this change for him. So now that we've got this done, we'll go ahead and commit this to our hotfix branch. We'll take a look and double check in the browser, make sure everything looks nasty and serif. Cool. So remember, we still have our branch sitting out there that has specials with new dates. Because of the branching that Git can do, we can set that aside and move to a different branch here. So now our hotfix has our commit change serif font, master's a little bit behind, and then we have our feature with the new dates. So what we want to do is jump back to master, has three commits, it's still a little bit behind. We're going to merge in our hotfix now. So now it's going to take all the commits in our hotfix and put them on master. Cool, so there it is. So now that's ready to push out on our production server. We've been able to leave our big feature that we're in the middle of, do a quick fix, push that out to production. And without interrupting our workflow too much, we're going to check out back to our feature, and we can continue on. Now if it's a really nasty hotfix, we probably want that here too. So we can take what master has and pull that forward into our feature as well. So this is where we get a merge master into our feature. So not only did we update the production code, now our branch that we started maybe a week or two ago, we can pull those hot fixes in there as well. So now you'll see we have the change serif font entry, we've got our update dates for specials, and now we can finish our feature. So Irv finally emails us, said, okay, I got the, I got the uh, specials for this week, only going to change Tuesday. 
I'm gonna take out this barbecue bacon cheddar burger, ham and cheese. Cool. So go ahead and update that. Get that added to our repo again. So you have your files, you make your changes, put them into the staging area with git add, and then you add a commit message to explain what you changed. So now that's done, we can jump back to our master branch, merge that in. Now master will have both our hotfix and our feature. So there's our original update dates for specials. It knows that time frame wise, in the middle of that, I changed my serif font. And then after that, I did the update specials to wrap it up. So even if you're a single person or an individual working on stuff and you're not in a team, this is great. Once there's multiple developers, this kind of tracking is um, indispensable. I can't imagine working without it. So okay, so as I wrap up, um, one thing you may need to do is ignore files. And Git's perfect for this. You don't have to have everything in that folder as part of the repository. In Rails database uh, configuration, maybe unique to each person, you may have passwords or uh, user credentials. So if we create a passwords file, this is something that we perhaps don't want in the repository, especially if it's an open source project or you might share this code. So Git provides a really nice way to uh, take care of this. Now, by default, when you create this file, it says, hey, I got untracked files. I'd be glad to add those to the repository. So in your project, you can create a .git ignore file. And there's some interesting syntax you can do. You can list the file name. You can do some wildcards to match multiple files or folders. So now, after creating this .git ignore, we tell it, don't look at the passwords file. Just ignore that. Now our git status shows that we have a git ignore file to add to our repository, but no passwords. So that's done. For a Mac and some other situations, you can actually create a system-wide git ignore. So if you've seen those annoying DS store files that are hidden on a Mac, you can have those ignored across all your projects. And that sits in your user folder. As you can see, there's some wildcard anything in the log folder. So log slash star, ignore that. Good deal. All right, so real quickly, we've used git log to look at changes, but there's a lot of things you can do. Git log has a lot of different options. Um, there's git diff, which I'll show, I think, a little bit here in a moment. But just know as you get using Git, there's a lot of customization. You can look at your log in different formats. I think a month or so ago, the guy showed a cool chart view that'll show you the branches and have a little diagram down the side. So as you get a larger history of things, you may find some different tools will be helpful. As you're making changes to your files, then git diff is extremely helpful to see what's going on. As I'm working in code, I might change 20 files at a time, working on a feature. And before I commit that, I'd like to do a diff. What, what did I do? What is Git going to record that I changed? So by doing git diff, here it shows you I took out Tim Harvey, and I switched it out for Tim Harvey with at T-I-H-M. When you've got a lot of files, this is really handy to look through and see if you've got any crufty comments. Did you put anything in that maybe you didn't mean to? You can also give git diff some different parameters to say how far back should I look. Default, it'll be just one commit, or excuse me, what changes you have currently. But by telling it to look farther, we can see here it's got our password changed from the previous commit and the current one. So you can give it some different time frames, which can be helpful. So here we look back a little bit further, and now it has our deal. So finally then, git runs great on your personal machine. But GitHub kind of takes it to the next level. It makes it easy to share code with other people. 
It has sort of some social aspects where you can share code publicly, you can watch certain people, you get an activity, uh, public activity feed of what are people doing that you're watching, that you're curious of. It also makes a nice viewer if you're getting started with Git. So this is the Irv's Cafe uh, source code, the whole project. This is kind of a nice way to dig through and look at commits, look at what was changed. All of this you could do in your command line, but if you're more comfortable with a web interface, this is really nice. So we have a commit history. This is very similar to our Git log. It's just nicer looking. You can click these links down the side to look at exactly what changed as part of that commit. It also gives you a nice way to comment on code. Uh, we use that in our project all the time. If somebody checks in some code, we're not sure what they were doing or have a suggested refactor, you can just comment right in the code and they get an email with that. So GitHub's a great way to work on both a private team project or something that you have publicly. So we talked about uh, Git commit messages. So can you remember, I think this is Tim Pope, wrote this great blog article about how he structures his commit messages. Um, it's a great read. He gives some good uh, convention for how to do it. A couple of the blog posts that I talked about are on links.timharvey.net. And so if you want to see that, there's links to the uh, git commit message, the branching scheme, and some other good stuff. Cool. That's it. Hey, Tim, on a yes. more practical level, do you branch off the master every time you start something new? That's a great or question. Like, how often do you do that? Yeah, so the question is, do, do I branch all the time when I'm making a change? Um, it depends. I try to most of the time because invariably what I think is going to be a small one hour change turns into a two or three hour change and 20 minutes into it I've made a few commits and somebody says, hey, what's wrong with this thing over here? Could you tweak that? So if you're in a branch, great. Um, if you're on master and you've made some commits, you're kind of stuck. I mean, there are ways to back out of it, but generally I try to, once I make a commit, I try to leave stuff alone. And so how do you keep track of your branches if, say, you, for some reason you've got three going on at once? Yeah, and that's, that's another good question. So Git can do some things to show you what branches you have open. You can delete them as you go, as you get things uh, merged in. And Git's nice. If you try to delete a branch and it sees that you haven't pulled that in, it's going to warn you. Say, now, wait a minute. That's some fresh code that you might not want to lose. So it stops you there. Um, yeah, so when possible, I try to do the branching. I found lately I try to do really small features as much as possible. I don't try to go a few days on a branch because there's several of us in the office. And we get too far out of whack, a week, two week old branch, and it gets tough to merge them. One of the things we didn't look at is a merge conflict. Um, when you try to bring two sets of code together, we might, have, we might have had two different developers tweak that line of CSS which specified what the font was. Well, uh, Git will actually show you, here's what developer A put, here's what you got. You figure it out. Now you get that across 20 or 30 files, lots of changes, and that can get pretty hairy. So we try to keep our commits small. We try to push that stuff into GitHub frequently. And that makes life easier if you're merging conflicts. Is it possible to use file merge instead of the built-in div? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so. There's probably a lot. There's some other people that are a lot smarter on Git than I am. So yeah, Git does a crazy bunch of stuff. So it's it's a really good tool. Do you use any uh, visual, visualization of uh, like GitX or anything mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, there's some great tools. GitX is one of them on the Mac that essentially looks at your local repository. Imagine GitHub's viewing tools, but you get it locally. So GitX is a good one. Um, I try to force myself to use the command line because it's faster. And I try to be a keyboard nerd, but I'm sort of a poser. <laughs> so I have to interrupt back to GitHub. Yeah, and in the off note, um, I know you mentioned you're an iPhone developer. If anyone else is interested in that, the new Xcode version will support Git in addition to the usual subroutine too. And that's a great point. There's there are code tools if you're not a TextMate or Vim or Emacs guy. Um, there are visual tools to actually handle committing and staging and all of that stuff. Xcode will even show you the uh, file merge like two pane view within it in the new version, which is really neat. Yeah. Cool. Tim, have Thanks, you guys. seen the Have you seen the Git achievements? Um, I don't. I don't know what the hell it counts as. Well, I want to say plugin, but 
it, it kind of takes the idea of like an Xbox 360 achievement yeah. and wraps it around Git. So as you make more comments and stuff, it unwraps it. It's pretty cool. I think that's yeah. awesome. So I saw it a couple is, months ago, but I, I forgot to look at it. What you do is, uh, I think it's a gem, and then you alias. Yeah, um, that's right. You, you alias, alias the git. git command to basically run through Git achievements. And then Git achievements will record the things you've done in a separate Git repository. And when you when you attain a new achievement, it will push a repository that contains an HTML file up to GitHub, <laughs> so that you can visit uh, your username.github.com/slash/git-achievements and see a list of your achievements. So the nerdier the commands you use, the more achievements you get. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's something like 98 achievements unlockable. That's awesome. I think it'll also it'll tweak your signature on your Git. Commits too, so it includes oh, a really? hashtag with all the achievements you got. I, uh, I suggested today someone should take that and make like an RP Git, like a, a Git RPG or something, or nice. start off with the achievements each have like an associated avatar. Like, say it starts off with like a dwarf who's just wearing like a, a shirt or whatever, and then you gain an achievement and he gets like a, a you know a helmet. <laughs> That could, like, I, I don't know. I, I guess I'm huge and nerdy. <laughs> you are. But I think that would be Anybody hilarious. that can make learning into a game, go for that. Yeah. There is a GitHub achievements also. And so if you've already posted a bunch of stuff to GitHub, you can go there and see how you rank without even doing all that aliasing or whatever. Hey Miles, would you be able to tell us like a ghost story with that the lighting just looks like it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I got nothing. Cool, excellent talk, Tim. That was great. Thanks. Thanks.